Thank you. <laughs> Dean, faculty, staff, distinguished guest, who in many cases have traveled great distances to be here with us today. And finally, the fellow members of my EML cohort. Simply saying that this opportunity to speak is humbling somehow doesn't seem to be enough to capture the gravity of this moment. This is especially true given the occasion that brings us together in the past year that we've spent with one another. It was just a few weeks ago that my classmates voted to elect me to represent them as the speaker at commencement. I was not only surprised, but became emotional and, and nearly driven to tears. Not by the fact that this collection of people that I greatly respect would be interested in, in what this, their youngest classmate, would have to say, but I nearly cried at the thought of having to complete yet one more assignment and effectively write one last paper just when I thought that school was over. Upon hearing of the vote, I pulled our class president aside and I thanked him. And then I demanded a recount. <laughs> no, it, it really is an honor, thank you. And as I drove home from our closing residency where the vote took place, I started to think about what it was I would say when I was standing here. I was nervous. After all, what does one say to 25 of his closest friends and several other of their closest friends. I reflected back to my own graduation from my undergraduate university some 10 years ago. The commencement speaker on that day uh, was a renowned journalist. And reflecting on his speeches helped me immensely with this one. Because as I thought back, I couldn't remember a single word he said. And then I suddenly relaxed. The thought that my words may actually soon be forgotten is encouraging. And it takes a lot of the pressure off. So perhaps I will be just as effective at moving you today as he was. So much so that you forget exactly what it is that I've spoken about. No, it's, it's not lost on me that you may indeed forget this speech. But what you won't forget is what's transpired over the past 12 months. Though it seems to have gone by quickly, I think most of you would agree, this year has seen many long and sometimes difficult moments for each of us. Do you remember the time you had enough and you wanted to quit? The point at which sleep became a distant memory and spare time was a luxury afforded only to the lucky. It was, it was brutal at times. But can anyone sitting here this morning not feel deeply thankful for what has occurred in the time that's passed or for the lasting relationships that we've all forged? It's hard to imagine that this journey began together with a collection of 26 strangers who all seemingly came for different reasons and traveled different paths to get here. It's true that each and every member of this cohort has a story. And I'm of the belief that they're all different, yet somehow the same. We represent both genders, came from the four corners of the globe, represent many cultures and nationalities, age groups, and religions. Our experiences prior to EML all vary, yet have all led us to this time and this place, this shared moment in our lives. It's remarkable that we could be so different, but now be affiliated with the same distinguished groups. We're now Georgetown alumni, graduates of the famed McDonnell School of Business. I would argue that on the surface, our stories prior to EML appear very different. 
but at their core stands an individual who, for one reason or another, took a small bite of achievement and loved the taste. That somewhere saw a wrong and sought to make it right. That had stirring in them a thirst for something greater. That one day looked in the mirror and saw staring back at them someone who desired to lead. That's why we're here. Well, now that chance has come. We're leaders. We made it. And if you need proof, I'm told the degree even says so. But what does it mean to lead? What will it mean for us? What will ultimately be the value of this experience here at Georgetown? Well, the faculty here will tell you that by accepting the aforementioned degree, that it's incumbent on us to emerge somehow transformed and venture out into the world to affect change. It's our responsibility to go forth and excel at whatever it is we choose. Well, I interpret that to mean that it's not enough for us simply to go back to work and get bigger titles or more money, to write a book or start a business, or to continue proudly serving our country as so many of our classmates do. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't do those things, but only that we should do them better than others. That we must not cheat ourselves into thinking that somehow working hard is enough. That we must focus instead on achieving superior results while fostering a social consciousness at every turn. To be the best we possibly can at whatever it is our path leads us to next. While never losing sight of the impact that we can have through our words and through our actions on those around us. That we hire a veteran or a minority when the opportunity presents itself. Instead of simply helping women get a seat at the table, that we instead fight to get them seated at the head of the table. Some of you may recall that we took a short field trip to Cape Town, South Africa. I still have vivid memories of that trip because the Images and experiences were powerful enough to stay with me for a lifetime. Because I was feeling a bit under the weather, I wasn't able to visit Langa Township with the rest of the class. On my final taxi ride to the airport, a hotel staff member instructed his driver to take me there and make sure that I could see all that there was to see. Upon arriving, we entered the visitor center and I met a woman named Faith. It's ironic, given Faith's story. A mother of four who had lost their father to malaria just a few short months earlier. She made these beautiful necklaces made of ostrich bone and colorful rocks and she sold them to feed her family. I purchased four of them for the cost of a hundred rand, which was roughly ten to fifteen dollars given the exchange rate. So overcome with emotion, her eyes filled with tears and she fell to her knees. A woman nearby explained that would be enough to feed her family for weeks. Someone else whispered in my ear to never forget the people I met there or the things I had seen and to come back because South Africa needed people like us. And all the while it struck me as strange that one moment I could eat in a, a multi-course meal in a five-star restaurant and take a cab less than 10 minutes away to a neighborhood without adequate schools or hospitals 
or clean water. Well, the truth is, you don't need to go to Cape Town for that. Try Baltimore or L.A., St. Louis, or even my hometown of Detroit. That story, like so many others we all remember from that trip, serve as a reminder for us as leaders to show empathy for those who are less fortunate. Our failure to do so is what will enable real monstrosities in the world. Though not committing acts of evil ourselves, we can collude with it through our own apathy. What we achieved during this program inwardly should change our outward reality. Better said, the transformation we achieved internally should now be visible externally to all around us. The truth is, I can't even remember what I was like before the start of this program. And I'm not sure I would recognize my former self if you walked in this room today. My hope is that others see that same change too. We have an inescapable connection to the global community and the fact that we touch other people's lives by simply existing. The question becomes, how much are you willing to touch other people's lives? Your intelligence, your capacity for hard work, the education you have earned and received give you unique social standing and responsibilities. It will be on display in the way you vote, in the way you live, the way you protest, the demands you make of your government, the advice you give your children, the level of respect with which you treat your spouse. We cannot underestimate the power of our example. It is our privilege, and it's also our burden. But if you choose to use your status and influence to raise your voice on behalf of those who have no voice, and if you choose to identify not only with the powerful but the powerless, if you retain the ability to imagine yourselves into the lives of those who do not have your advantages, then it will not just be your proud families who celebrate your existence, but thousands of others whose realities you've helped change. We have the power and the creativity within us to make this happen and to leave this planet somehow better than the way we found it. We can't fix every problem, but the ones that we can, we must. Now is the time to think broadly with big ideas. For a year, we've worked tirelessly, giving up time with friends and loved ones, sacrificing hobbies and workouts and sleep. For a year, we've been buying and exchanging and selling everything we have in terms of energy and ideas. It's been a series of intellectual transactions and investments that have paid off Hopefully. Our pockets are now full of knowledge where there used to be money. But now we've got to figure out what to spend that knowledge on and those ideas on and what change it is that we're going to stand for. Well, the going rate for change is not cheap. It's pricey. The founders of this university, along with its many great graduates that have walked its halls, they all knew that. They all figured out that if you're going to be a man or a woman of your word, if you're going to live up to your ideas and your education, that it doesn't come easy and that it's going to cost you. So my question to you, EML, is what are you going to do next to validate this degree, how much are you willing to pay? What's your vision, your big idea? What are you willing to spend your moral capital, your intellectual capital, your hard-earned cash, your sweat equity in pursuing outside of the walls of Georgetown? 
As newly crowned leaders, it's our responsibility to develop visions that inspire others to achieve what was thought unachievable, to stretch for what was thought unreachable, and to believe in what may often seem unbelievable, to have a healthy disregard for what others say cannot be done. The best people want to work on the biggest challenges. They want to solve our energy crisis. They want to find better ways to educate our young people. They want to fundraise for hospitals. They want to perfect clothing design. They want to find solutions for enhancing pet care, make advancements in nanotechnology safe, optimize medical care for our veterans, and increase the number of women in leadership positions and even prepare better strategies for approaching the fourth quarter of life. We should always want to work on something that is uncomfortably exciting. It's my hope that we never lose the optimism that we share right now for the future. And so my final comments are those of gratitude and and appreciation. First of all, to the families who have supported us on this journey, the parents and the spouses and the children. Thank you for sharing your loved ones with me. But more importantly, thank you for your patience and understanding when they couldn't be there with you because there were papers to write or classes to attend. For being strong in their moments of weakness. Your support made this possible. To the employers who gave us the time and space to participate, acknowledging the value of executive education, making the investment in us while we invested in ourselves. Their support made this possible. To the Georgetown staff, thank you for all you've done to make this experience as memorable as possible. To the many who kept the wheels turning and our schedule moving and our needs met, your support made this possible. To the outstanding members of the faculty, Your words inspired us. Your assignments challenged us. Your contagious passion and commitment engaged us. I now know that leading teams is a science. The communication is strategic. Decision making is a process. Culture matters. And I also know to stay alert at all times for the evils of the world. And finally, to my classmates, you have changed me in ways that I never could have imagined. In you, I have seen commitment and strength, resolve. I've seen heart. I've seen grace and wisdom and virtue and a never quit attitude. I now have 25 role models to look up to. I expect great things from each of you, and I also expect that you demand the same of me. Don't forget the vigorous class debates and how complicated the dynamics of team projects can be. The late nights trying to write meaningful essays, or the jobs that were lost or found, the babies that were born, or those who are still expected. But in addition to the memories, EML, don't forget the charge that we have been given and the responsibility that we now have as leaders. This is not the end for us, but rather the beginning. But it is the end of this speech. Thank you, EML. Congratulations. Thank you.